It's Sunday morning, and every decent man and woman is listening to Test Miles with Nick Miles on FM News 101 KXL. Buckle in. Well, Sunday morning at 10.06 a.m., and we're on FM News 101. I'm Nick Miles, and you're listening to Portland's Automotive Radio Show. Tess Miles, locally created, nationally celebrated. Good morning, everyone. Our team of uh, misfits, rapscallions, and ne'er-do-wells has been assembled to bring you the world's most up-to-date uh, automotive news and reviews, and, of course, our own comment. So let's introduce the team, the fire of the show, and the voice of maturity and reason, Brad. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, yeah, I brought family in today. My in-laws, they had choice, come watch us do the show or go to church. And you chose and the dog And they came to do this. But I've been driving around in our Lucky Limousine charity vehicle all week, parades and all sorts of fun stuff. So You've it's had been a good interesting. Week. Hand-painted by kids, and we donate it back to children's hospitals. So it's colorful. You donate the profits, not the donate car. Donate the profits. Actually, we've donated the car, so we give rides to families who need rides back and forth to hospitals. Excellent. Good job for you, doing your, uh, your good duty. A man who's truly passionate about cars, but not much else, Sean Walker. Good morning, Sean. Good morning, Nick. What's going on with you? Not much. Uh, just doing a little driving. Went to beaches this weekend. and Checked out all the cars? Checked out all the cars. Had Took some... my vet out. Had some fun. We'll be talking more about a gathering of car people later in the show. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to be talking a bit, little bit about uh, the local cars and coffee events. So if you have something kind of cool, you can bring it in. Uh, my pal and professional passenger and also the show's producer, Andrew Awesome. Good morning. Hello, Nick. What's been going on with you? Uh, you know, it's a, it's a full-time job just being me. So uh, I'm, I'm clocking in and clocking out and doing what I can, you know what I mean? Excellent. Yeah. I like you getting overtime for that? No, but I, don't, I can't pay myself overtime. So eight Man, hours you got to pay yourself clock some overtime. <laughs> I know, I should. I deserve it. He's on a budget. All right, time for the news quiz where we look at what's happening in the automotive world and see how up-to-date our crew is and what they absorbed during the week of the biggest automotive news story. It's a question and answer session, and let's see who knows the most. GM recall is leading to what phenomena? I got this. Brad, go I'm ahead. on this. So GM, the hardest part of selling a car is getting people in the showroom. GM masterfully has figured out how to do this. They recall 23 million cars, get people into the showroom, then say, hey, come on over to the new car park, and then they sell them a new car. So is, their, isn't that their brilliant? market share has gone up from 163 to 18.8 since the recalls. Excellent. What a, what a brilliant sales strategy. Recall all your vehicles, put people in the showrooms, and they'll buy new ones. Magical. Chrysler is uh, letting what 707 horsepower beast out into the wild? The Hellcats. Oh, Sean, you'd like to take this Yeah, one? no, I'm just jumping in. I'm sorry, but this is one of Chrysler's best vehicles. It's the Hellcat. We've been there when they've actually, we haven't driven it yet. We're going to in a few weeks, which I'm excited for, but we've been there when they've turned the engine on, and it's just total orgasmic, the sound of the engine that comes out. It's a 707-horsepower engine. It does. It sounds like a tractor or something. What? Oh, go ahead. Which the one cool thing I like is I've read that GM's also going to try to beef up the Camaro. So it's just bringing back that old school muscle car wars. Yeah. What I, I like on this car is they give you the Matrix red key and the black key. So the red key gives you the full 700 horsepower. The black key only gives you 500. So right. when you and give it to the Ford valet. Did that. Ford did that with the Boss, right? Yes. The, the 302. They did that, a track version of the key, and, uh, and, that, and that's a clever idea, too, because if you ever lend it to anyone, you make sure they get the less horsepower because, uh, so they, they can't screw it up. All right, on to the next question. Stockholders, attention stockholders, you should be buying stock in what company regarding the future of cars? Uh, me, I got it. Okay, go. Uh, let's see. You should be buying stock in Google and Infineon. Because? They are, uh, well, basically what we're getting at is in the, in the new – a day and era of all the modern technology, um, you're, you're buying stock into the, the back end of everything, the brains, the chips, all the things that are making, uh, that are integrating the new apps and all the new uh, media into the cars today. It, it's, it's everyone that's compiling it and making it nice and easy package for us to use. All right, so, these are the guys that are expected to have the forefront of technology of the new self-driving cars. And so if you want to get in early, it's like telling you about Apple before anybody knew about Apple buying into the stock. Is this insider trading? Are we okay? Yeah, I think we're okay since we don't have a vested interest. GM recall is going to cost how much in profit? Anybody? Who read this story? GM recall is going to cost how much in profit? 
Five hundred million? No, it's more than that. Uh, I think the actual answer is it's going to take about fifty percent of their profit. Okay. The estimated profit from GM. So uh, what we know about uh, the continuing troubles at GM is the recall seems to be helping uh, them lose at least fifty percent of their profits. Uh, that is the worst case scenario, I think. Uh, but. Let's see. Increasing the sales of their vehicles may kind of off-balance that. Isn't it like $1.2 billion they have reserved for this now? Well, GM is not a cash-rich company. Uh, Toyota has about $20 billion in reserve. I think GM only has about $2 billion in reserve. So it's going to at least wipe out. Only uh, $2 billion yeah, in reserve. It's going it's <laughs> it's to wipe out at least 50% of their profit. You were going to say something? No, we're good. Well, which vehicle came in first for most American vehicle? I got this. You mean most American? Most American? Most American, American car. Vehicle. America. Finally, is, we got an American car. It's the Ford F-150. Right. Uh, the the idea is it takes uh, – it took the award for most American list. The list reflects the amount of parts made in America or and the to, amount of the vehicle. To get on this list, you had to have 75% or more of your parts made in America. It would You know what really surprises me is most of the other vehicles on the list are actually Japanese car manufacturers. Absolutely. So number, number two is Camry. Three is Odyssey. Four is Toyota Sienna. Five is to Toyota Tundra. Six is the Avalon. Chevy Corvette Stingray is seven, Honda Ridgeline eight, Honda Crosstour is nine, and the SRT Viper is number 10. So what's sad about this is in 2014, 13 vehicles qualified. In, in 2012, there were 30 vehicles right. that qualified for 75% of the It doesn't more. necessarily make sense. I mean, to me, it's about where the car is built and how many parts it has in America, not who owns the car company. So a lot of these cars are actually built in America. Not all the parts are American. Not all the parts. That is the downfall. All right, we've got a really packed show for you today. What's coming up on the show? Well, we're, we're going to talk to the historian from Dodge, and the historian's going to tell us about the 100-year celebration. Uh, went back east very recently to check out uh, 100 years of Dodge. These guys rolled out 100 years of cars, the cars that they have made over 100 years, and let Sean and I drive them. So we got our choice in which car we wanted to wow. drive. Did you touch all So they're not going to make it to 101. I, would, I hope they, hope they are. <laughs> their, their celebration is actually 100 years of Dodge in November this year. And uh, to have some of those cars rolled out. Now, I will tell you, we started with about 20 cars out on the field. Not all 20 cars were available at the end of the day. Because some Man. of our fellow auto journalists have no clue how to drive a three-speed manual transmission with the brake-off or use a clutch, there was some pretty horrific scenes. We'll talk more about that. We're also going to be talking to, uh, to Mark Schultz about cars and coffee. This is uh, one of the biggest car events that's held weekly in Portland, and we'll talk about what vehicles we've been driving. All that is coming up on Test Styles this morning. You're on FM News 101, and we will have more about what's going on in the car world next. I'm Nick Miles. It's Test Miles on FM News 101. Test Miles, like NASCAR, but with one right turn. TestMiles.com. Welcome back to Test Miles on FM News 101. I am Nick Miles, and if you'd like more Test Miles information, please visit our website at testmiles.com. Now, I've just returned from Rochester Hills in Michigan and a very special place called Meadowbrook Hall, which is the family home of Dodge. Dodge is celebrating 100 years of making automobiles. The Dodge company made transmissions for Old Oldsmobile and supplied parts for Ford before making their own car. The first Dodge was built in November 1914. The company was... Really an instant success with that vehicle. And when the Dodge brothers died in 1920, they employed 22,000 workers and produced 140,000 vehicles a year. While at Meadowbrook Hall, Dodge rolled out 100 years of vehicles for us to drive. And joining us on the phone to talk with us about some of the cars that Dodge brought out for us to drive is Brant Rosenbush. And Brant is, is the historian for Dodge. Brant, what was the oldest car that we got to drive there? Well, we had um, a 1915 Dodge that actually we drove uh, for everybody because there's a, there's a few things that you need to know about them before hopping in. Uh, but then the earliest one we let the uh, journalists drive was a 1927 Dodge Cabriolet. 
Now, I've, I clearly understand not uh, trusting some of those Dodge, uh, or some of the auto journalists to drive those Dodge cars because not quite all of the cars made it to the end of the event. A, f a few of them uh, yeah. uh, choked out a little bit. But tell me a little bit about that 1915. Uh, uh, was that the very, well, that, that car was designed and built actually in the Meadowbrook Hall area, wasn't it? Well, it was actually designed on the property of Meadowbrook Hall. That goes back to uh, John Dodge bought a farm in Rochester Hills um, in 1908. And he and Horace would go up to the farmhouse on the weekends, lay out the drawings, and actually design that car right there. Uh, and then it was produced at the Dodge plant, which was actually in Hamtramck, Michigan, about 40 miles south of there. Now, it's quite a collection that you, you guys at Dodge have put together there. Are you basically in charge of the collection, or you're just in charge of all the knowledge? Well, I'm in charge of all the vehicles and the archives. So uh, the, as a corporation, we house about 350 vehicles. Um, the Dodge brand, uh, about 100 of those are Dodges. Um, now so that I have the joy of bringing those all out. You did, and we really thank you for that, because to be able to see 100 years of cars and to drive them was a lot of fun. I know that Sean spent his time li uh, queuing up to drive the Super B, didn't you, Sean? Yeah, I, that was the first thing when they let go of the meeting, I ran right to the 69 Daytona and I was just excited to drive that. I even went up and hugged Scott Brown and said I loved him for that because out of all the cars we've ever driven, that was the coolest thing I've ever had. <laughs> I mean, there's definitely a, good, a lot of good lookers out there. One of the cars that I think looked the, the, the best was the, the Dodge uh, Senior 6 Roadster uh, brand, which it really has that look of like the 1920s gangster look, doesn't it? Yeah, it's a total classic look with the uh, long hood and the rumble seat and the, the trunk on the back. And that's actually one of our uh, the best vehicles to drive uh, about everything we had out there. It's really smooth to drive, lots of power for its size, and it's just a classic. So uh, I made sure to try and direct everybody to get a chance to drive that one. I think one of the most impressive vehicles that a lot of people didn't know, and we, we clearly know that under the Chrysler umbrella is Jeep, and Jeep were very famous for their vehicles in the Second World War, but Dodge also built military vehicles, didn't it? And that Dodge Commando car was, uh, was there for us to drive. Yeah, the uh, Dodge built over 500,000 trucks, uh, mostly three-quarter ton for the war effort during World War II. Uh, that, the one we brought out was actually very rare. It's a 1941, and it's a half ton, whereas everything else we really built were three-quarter ton. And the, uh, but the direct lineage from that would be the power wagon that came out after the war. Uh, the Dodge Power Way that we built from 46 through 68, uh, the roots are right there in that truck. And, it's, and that one's a really fun one to drive. Uh, I have the honor of driving veterans in, in Fourth of July Memorial Day parades every year. And uh, so it's, we take them in that one, and, and it's just a joy to drive. Yeah, and I love the, the fact is that we don't necessarily associate Dodge, although every company did their part. We don't associate them so much with the war effort, but uh, that was a real big part for them. Now, the real era, I think, that shines for Dodge and in historical area is the 60s. And there is so many amazing cars from the 60s there. Uh, the, the, the Charger with the, uh, the, the Lawman Charger was probably one of my favorite vehicles. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, that's a fun one. That's actually the first year that the street Hemi came out and, and the general public could buy the Hemi. Uh, and that drag car is called the Lawman. It was driven by L. Ekstrand. Uh, he was a lawyer here at Chrysler as, log, as well as a uh, drag racer. So hence the name Lawman. Uh, we bought that from Al uh, probably about 15 years ago. Uh, and that one was used to give uh, veterans returning from Vietnam safe driving demonstrations. And so that one's traveled the world, has uh, spent a lot of time in England, but it's been to uh, Germany and as well as uh, Vietnam. Now, some of the vehicles, I think, look um, absolutely amazing. I can't even believe that they were, they were street legal cars in a sense, too, especially the, the Charger Daytona with that giant fin on the back. It's almost big enough to, uh, I, I don't know, it's, I've never seen a fin that far off the back of the car, and, and especially that, that nose with the lights that pop up, the copper-colored nose. Tell me a little bit about the, the Daytona, and, and really, was, was that actually a street car, or was it just a NASCAR? Well, it was totally street legal, but it was built and born for NASCAR racing. Uh, you know, the 60s were pretty competitive amongst all the big three. Uh, we decided we've got the heavy engine, we need some aerodynamic push on it. Uh, so the Chrysler engineers developed the, the wing and the nose cone uh, to make it the most you know, aerodynamic vehicle in, in NASCAR at that time, but the general public could also buy them. So there was 501 of those available for sale to the general public. 
Uh, the, the funny part about the wing is it's fully functional, and it, you can actually adjust it um, for, for the setup you want. But the reason it's so high is so that the trunk could open. Uh, it, it, after about a foot, it doesn't matter if it's a foot or three feet. It just, they just decided to make it so that the trunk was still functional. And that's interesting because the modern fin or the wing on the back of a car is actually attached to the trunk, whereas this wasn't, right? No, it's attached on either sides and, and juts up th you know, three feet in the air from the trunk. Now, the Super B, uh, which I think a lot of people really enjoyed, the, the six, it was built from 68 to 70. Uh, this vehicle was built sort of as the everyman's muscle car, right? Yeah, it's really, um, I mean, you could almost look at it as SRT back in the 1960s. So you could go to the dealership and buy a uh, Super B, and it was a uh, lower-priced Dodge, but mid-sized. And you could get it with 383 up to a Hemi with the four-speed, and you basically had um, a street racing, you know, street legal dragster, and you could be out there running it. So it was definitely the performance car of its day. And the neat thing on that vehicle, it only has 400 miles on it. Um, with that vehicle was actually given to a trade school in Indiana, and a few years ago they called me and said, hey, we've got this car. We either have to give it back to you or we have to scrap it. And I asked them what it was, and they told me. So uh, we sent a brand-new vehicle down as fast as we could and brought that one back. I bet you did. Uh, it's kind of interesting, too, some of the history and, and the way it takes uh, turns, especially things like we associate the name Shelby very much with Ford nowadays. But really, he, uh, he worked on Dodges, obviously, and we remember that from the 1980s. Uh, and you had a you had a, a Carroll Shelby vehicle out there, didn't you? You had the, that Charger from the 80s. Yeah, we had, actually had two. We had the uh, 85 Shelby Charger um, and the 86 Shelby GLHS, uh, which uh, was the last one of the last 500 produced by Carroll Shelby. And the reason we teamed up with Mr. Shelby back then was he was uh, a friend of Lee Coca's back from the Ford days. And uh, Mr. Iacocca wanted to bring performance back into the brand where it had been in the 1960s but with the front-wheel drive layout that we were using then. So uh, Mr. Shelby helped us do that and you know, bring really the performance edge back to Dodge. Now, I think one of the interesting things is a lot of people forget, we always think often about those, those big, super-powered cars, but uh, you made a uh, Dodge made a bunch of smaller vehicles over the years which were super-powered, especially things like uh, the Omni in 86. That was basically a small car that really moved, wasn't it? Yeah, it was light, fast, um, and with you know turbocharged, and it was they're just a blast to drive, and you'll still see a lot of those cars in SCCA, uh, SCCA racing, along with uh, different kinds of neons too from the 90s, uh, the ACR and the SRT fours. People are still out there running them and competing with them and uh, having a blast. I think it's so amazing that uh, the. Things like the Neon, which is such a huge part of Dodge, there are so many vehicles there that we discount a lot of the times when we look at the history, but it was great to jump in a 1984 Caravan, it's great to jump in the old Neons because they were the backbone of America, weren't they? And they're still a, a big part of your celebration. Oh, for sure. I mean, uh, they were large volume vehicles um, that you know we're still very proud of. And when we were putting the list of vehicles together for the event, um, you know, initially the public relations pitched me doing this idea, and we obviously don't normally do this kind of thing. So I said, sure, I can get you five or eight vehicles. Excellent. Well, well, thank you, my friend, so much. We ran out of time. You're listening to okay. Tess Miles on FM News 101. I'm Nick Miles, and thanks to Dodge. Throw it in neutral and coast in with testmiles.com. Favorite us, tweet us, friend us. Love us all at testmiles.com. You're listening to Test Miles at FM News 101. I'm Nick Miles. And if you'd like more from us, please go to the website, testmiles.com. If you are uh, interested in NASCAR, we just, uh, we just watched a big pileup with Kyle Busch ending up on his roof. And uh, and looks like uh, NASCAR will be stalled for a while. No, no racing yesterday. So they of might the rain. as well listen to Test Miles. Yes, Test Miles way more interesting than NASCAR. We have our own little NASCAR. We go round in circles on this show. If you happen to wander into Starbucks on Carmen Drive at uh, I-5, uh, the particular address is uh, 15. 15350 Southwest Sequoia Parkway on a Saturday morning. I notice the parking lot behind it is very full of impressive cars. You might wonder what you want it into. Well, it ha happens to be car, cars and coffee. 
And uh, it's a national event that really has uh, segments around the country. I've been to cars and coffee all over the country. It's a gathering of exotic and interesting cars that uh, really have some rare cars amongst them uh, for their owners to show off while having a cup of coffee. And Mark Schultz is here, who uh, works with the Portland Cars and Coffee. And you guys, tell us a little about the event. You've been doing it for a while now. Correct. I'm one of three caretakers of the event. It's been running in Portland for five and a half years now. So we're the original Portland Cars and Coffee. It started five and a half years ago as an unofficial Ferrari and Lamborghini event up in Jansen Beach. And that worked for about six months until we realized that those who were staying out late Friday night really didn't make it in so early on Saturday mornings. So we moved it down to Bridgeport Village, expanded it beyond then, and now it encapsulates all enthusiasts of all marks, whether Ferrari, Lamborghini, Porsche, BMW, even Peugeot. How many cars do you get there? On average, 130 to 150 cars per week during the summer months. So far this summer, we've had two instances with over 200 cars. Now, tell me, what are the, some of the most exotic cars that you've seen there? One, we, there's one car that comes out. It is one of two street-legal Lola race cars. It just happens to have turn signals, and it drives at the event. And, and the value of some of these cars goes up to what? Uh, we've definitely seen cars that are worth over a million dollars. And so if somebody wants to, to bring a car to get involved, what's, what's the idea behind it? I mean, do they just show up? They literally just show up. It's simply about the community and the conversation that happen around the automotive enthusiast community. You just, whether you drive, ride, or cycle to get there, just show up. And you don't have to have a great car to show up, do no, you? You can, just, you can ride the bus. You can, you can ride the bus and just, just walk in and then Google at all the cars. Uh, you guys do this regardless of what happens as far as weather conditions. Right? Absolutely. Rain or shine or even snow. Now, you did have some cars show up when we had snow recently. We did. You? Back in February when we had that wonderful weekend snow, we had four cars, including a 911 on snow tires. That There were four cars in the parking lot. And, and so the, you say they're one of three caretakers, so there's sort of, it, it's definitely a group thing. It's not sort of commercial. It's not individual. You guys just do it because you love cars. Absolutely. It is simply a... It is simply a community of car enthusiasts. There is no official sponsorship. There, we, we do not run it that way. There is no sponsorship are in there, that regard. Are there any other segment, any other groups in Portland? There is another gathering. It's called the Cascade Cars and Coffee Group. They're up near the Ikea. And they, they, there were some enthusiasts who came to our event one day and started asking a bunch of questions. And three, year, three weeks later, we're suddenly promoting the new Portland Cars and Coffee they've sort of waxed and waned. Geographically, we can support that. We have clearly the number of enthusiasts in Portland, um, but I'm so busy at my event, I've never had a chance even to go up and go see their event. Yeah, but it's good that, I mean, it shows, it's great that there's two two events. You can see all the cars at one and then also see the cars at the other. Now, you go from 8 a.m. till 11, and remind us of the address. The, uh, literally, where I-5 and 217 come together, the next off-ramp just south of that is exit 291, Carman Drive, Carman Drive, easy right. to remember. Take the off-ramp, and make two quick right turns. And you, that, second, that second right turn turns you onto Sequoia Parkway. If you go too far, you get to Home Depot. Right. So it's that, right. And literally, it's in the Starbucks. As you make that right turn, there's a Starbucks. It's right behind the Starbucks. And, and two, up to 200 of the most exotic cars every week. Absolutely. And it changes. We probably have 30 or 40 regular cars. After that, everything else is just whatever shows up on a random basis. That's, that's the beauty of the event is the eclectic mix, the diversity that's there. Now, we're definitely going to have you back in several more times because you, uh, you do a lot more than just cars and coffee. Um, you, you are also involved in the Ferrari uh, scene as well, aren't you? Yes, I am. I am the regional director for the Northwest Region Ferrari Club of America, effectively Alaska, Washington, Oregon, Idaho, Montana. I'm responsible to make sure that the Ferrari Club owners have fun and just enjoy their vehicles. Now, that would lead me to believe that you own a Ferrari. I just may. <laughs> and you just, you just own one. What do you have? What do you have in your collection? Currently, I have a 1985 Ferrari 308 Quattro Valve. Quattro and, Valve and I've actually seen you. You drive it quite regularly, don't I you? I put 5,000 miles on it a year, and I drive it any day. It's sunny. Like what you today. drive in today? Gee, a red Ferrari. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Uh, you're, you're also, uh, you also do a bunch of other stuff, and one of your specialties is you work. Uh, your, your real job, which we all have, is uh, you, you're a realtor, and you do cars, your homes for cars, right? Correct. I have a unique niche in real estate. I cater to car enthusiasts. I, I specialize in homes with significant garages or garage features that cater to car enthusiasts. Obviously, most guys generally want larger garages just across the board, but my unique niche comes in my expertise and my knowledge based on the garage in both improvements to the garage, whether it be lifts, epoxy floor coatings, cabinetry, lighting, indoor wash stations. 
as well as when it comes time to sell those properties, knowing how to market those homes to fellow, my, fellow enthusiasts who will appreciate and subsequently pay for those additional enhancements to the garage. And if someone wants to find out about uh, buying a home from, from you, especially because they're a car enthusiast, how do they get hold of you? The best way to reach me, frankly, is through my website, portlandhomes4cars.com. Spell it all out in words, portlandhomes4cars.com. Go there. You get to look at all sorts of – every garage in Portland that's on the market with four cars or larger, you'll see on the website – and just some cool cars and cool pictures along the way. Excellent. Well, we we hope you'll stick around for the next segment where we're going to talk about what we've been driving this week, and maybe you can pitch in there. Love also, to. going to get an opportunity to uh, to meet my nephews who are in town, uh, William and Nicholas. They're in town because my parents were celebrating their 40th wedding anniversary, sorry, 50th wedding anniversary on July 4th. But they have been uh, touring the United States in a Dodge Caravan. We're going to find out about that. Plus, I had the Denali out of our garage, which Brad had a couple of weeks ago, and I took them to Wings and Waves in a couple of places. We're going to find out what Brad's been driving, what Sean's been driving, and we're going to find out a little bit about what's going on in NASCAR because they had a, a giant pileup just uh, a few minutes ago. So we'll, we'll bring you up to date with that. You're listening to FM News 101. I'm Nick Miles. It's Tess Miles on FM News 101. Test Miles, like NASCAR, but with one right turn. Testmiles.com. Welcome to Test Miles on FM News 101. I am Nick Miles, and uh, you can go to our website for more information, testmiles.com. Follow us on Facebook or the Twitters. Uh, in the studio with us is Sean, Brad, uh, and Mark is still here, Andrew in charge of everything, and also uh, uh. my nephew uh, standing behind me, which makes me slightly nervous because we're all big teenage boys together and we like to attack me. They, they like to attack me during the break. They are, they are just 18 years. All right, Andrew, we had uh, cars out of the garage this week. What did you give us? Well, as always, you double dipped. Uh, so I gave you the Toyota Corolla and the Hyundai Santa Fe. Uh, Sean, I gave him the Nissan Versa Note, and Brad got the Kia Optima. Excellent. Well, let, let me talk to you a little bit about the Corolla. Impressed by this car, sales figures just came out for Toyota, and they knocked, uh, they've knocked they knocked Civic off the, off the list this year. Uh, the Corolla, a very good, small car, uh, roomy, comfortable ride. Uh, there's fuel efficiency of up to 42 miles a gallon. The bad things about it is the horsepower during acceleration and, and the Entune system is a little hard to use. 1.8-liter four-cylinder engine, 132 horsepower. Uh, front wheel drive about 37 miles a gallon the version i was driving goes up against the uh, civic and the kia forte there are four different trim levels and it starts around sixteen thousand dollars the santa fe which i think is very impressive for the price uh, starting price of twenty five thousand eight hundred twenty five dollars for the sport version which is the five seater spacious well designed lots of standard options and uh, a good value for money the fuel economy is a little lower than its rivals, and it's a 2.4-liter inline four-cylinder, which, uh, or it does have that twin-scroll turbo, uh, the, those two versions, 190 horsepower, 264, depending on you want, six-speed automatic, all-wheel drive, about 27 miles a gallon, goes up against the RAV4, the Rogue, the CRV, the Escape, the Murano, and the Pilot. Uh, there is the sports version, which is the five-seater, and the non-sports version, which is... Uh, the seven-seater version, and the tech inside is the Blue Link, which we could spend the whole show on, but $25,000 starting price. Brad or Sean? Sean, what have you been driving? I was driving the Nissan Versa Note, and it's a great little car for the city, but that's about it because I would not want to go on a long haul, and it's very tiny, but getting around in the city was awesome. I could find a parking space anywhere, good fuel economy. It only had 109 horsepower. Um Bad things about it was the seats were a little uncomfortable for me, but I could live with it. Um, it gets 35 miles to the gallon, and it starts at 14,000, so it's a great even, great little car for someone who's going to college or going to school or even a first-time buyer. I think that's one of the lowest starter prices that I've seen in a long time. Yeah, because cars now average around 20,000 to 30,000, but... You know, it's not a bad little car. It's just my thing is I wouldn't want to take it on a long haul. The one I had was the SL, which was the fully loaded with the tech package, which comes out at 20000 And I don't think you need the whole Nissan 360 camera 
for a car you could park in this room or parallel park in this room. In the studio. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Brad, what have you been driving? I got one of my favorite cars, the Kia Optima. So what Kia did beautifully is they brought in a German engineer, the guy famous for doing the Audi TT, to design this car, and it is spectacularly gorgeous. Now, it comes uh, – the great thing is almost everything on this car, and I – Tried to nitpick, and maybe the headroom in the back seat, if that's the worst you can do on a vehicle, that's pretty good. But the Optima comes in four different trim levels and two different engines. The 2.4 liter, 192 horsepower with a combined uh, miles per gallon of 27, but you have to step up to the 2 liter turbo for not a whole lot more money. You know, you do, you, Sean and I are both sold on this car. <laughs> we already love it. But 24 miles to the gallon on this thing, and it is, it combines everything both aesthetically and then inside with the Uvo system, it's one of the easiest to use systems for me, was their entertainment package system with the screen. Uh, 10 out of 10, I, you know, if I could get of an 11, I would do it. The only thing I think a downfall to this car is the resale value. I think it's with, with as good a job that it's doing now, but the, there are lease deals out there where you can get into well under $300. Yeah. And it, nothing it, down. It's, 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 an, it's an outstanding vehicle yeah. as well. Well, one of the things that uh, happens during the summer is that during summer months, you like to do a lot of traveling, and uh, people take road trips, and we'll definitely be talking about that over the next month. In fact, we've lined up four vehicles to do road trips in this month, and uh, the first one that I have been driving uh, for the road trip, I did a small road trip yesterday, was the uh, Denali, which is the same one Brad had out of the garage the other day. And this, uh, the GMC Denali, first of all, there's a lot of really cool features on this car. You could spend a show talking about the features on the car. For instance, the alarm system in it. If you have the sunroof or the windows open and somebody puts their hand into the vehicle while it's parked and locked, the alarm will go off. So if you accidentally leave the sunroof open, if you, uh, if you want to lock some, some stuff in the vehicle, it has a compartment behind the, the screen, the infotainment screen that comes up, and you can slot anything in. We've got an iPad mini in there. So it, it takes a lot of stuff. Interesting, on, when I was on the launch of this vehicle, somebody asked if, if, it, would, if it was handgun safe. <laughs> Clearly, it was a, an automotive journalist from Texas. But they wanted to know if they could put their handgun inside the... But you can lock that with a pin code that, that even when it's in valet mode, can't be opened unless you have the pin code. Uh, the OnStar system, which I use all the time, absolutely incredible. I want to go somewhere, press the OnStar system, tell them where you're looking, they send the directions. It was right. great. I, I, I use that all the time. And the accident avoidance system, I love too. Yes, and, uh, and that, but I've never seen that activated when I've been driving it. It's never oh, I come drove on. it, and it just gave you little vibrations in the seat. Oh, on yeah. Your side. Well, I, it was spectacular. Clearly, I'm a lot better driving. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I've never had that problem with it. Uh, but but uh, I want to introduce you to my nephews. Um, Nicholas, you're he's 16. How are you? I'm good, thanks. And so you uh, were a passenger in this Denali yesterday, and what did you think about it? What was your favorite part? Well, I thought it was really comfortable, and um, the little TV that came down from the top was uh, quite good. Yeah, but you, so you watched, what did you watch? You watched three movies in that, didn't you? Uh, we watched The Lion King, Rush Hour 3, and I can't quite Family remember. Family Guy. That was all. Family one. Guy, yeah. So Not on clear play though, right? Uh, no, you know, it, no, it wasn't the uh, the... The three minute version. version. We, watched, we watched the uncensored, and and, and uh, your dad was sitting next to us, Victorian dad, and he actually didn't complain about any of the uh, the language in Family Guy, so that was pretty good. Um, now uh, you also, I should get William in here. Come on, they're all shy; they don't want to come to the microphone. Uh, you guys, you drove up from where? Where you, you landed in the United States two weeks ago, and you you did a road trip. Yeah, we drove up from San Diego all the way to Portland. And you drove. What was the car that mum and dad got? Uh, the Dodge Caravan. Now, you, so you spent two weeks in use of the Dodge Caravan, exactly how it should be used. How was it? It was great. It was so spacious. There's loads of room for all the cases. You could get surfboard in the back. It was and, beautiful. And you got stuff on the roof, didn't you? What did you bring on the roof? Uh, we brought two green kayaks. So you bought them in San Diego and you sold them when you got here to Next Adventure, right? Yeah. So you did a lot of kayaking. Now, you do kayaking anyway, so is this a vehicle you'd have at home for kayaks? Uh, yeah, it's quite easy to put everything on top. So it's just a really good car. I actually have video of you guys taking the kayaks on and off. It's Let me get this toys. straight. Minivan love? Yeah, no, okay. for, for definitely for road Welcome trips. Welcome to my team. The, 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 <laughs> for, for road trips, it's, the, yeah, I can tell you, team minivan wins, Brad. For, <laughs> Thank you. For, for, for definitely for road trips. All right, guys, thanks very much. Uh, now, when, when you go home, your mom and dad, your, then, well, your mom's got a brand new Scirocco, hasn't she? Yes, yeah, she does. And, and she loves it. We don't get them here, though. Really? Yeah, they don't have Scirocco in the United States, so we're all sad about that. And your dad has a, a truck, the same as the Frontier. 
Yeah. So you you that's what you put the kayaks in when you're at home. Yeah. All right. We're gonna we're gonna celebrate with uh, more road trips. I've got a bunch more road trip vehicles coming up in the next month or so. Especially hired those too. It's Test Miles on FM News 101.